your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. everybody and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. The opening song you just were listening to was called I Am He and that was done by Lon Milo Duquette who just happens to be my guest on the show tonight. Lon is the author of 17 books translated into 12 languages. He's also an award-winning singer, songwriter and recording artist whose musical career has spanned more than 50 years. He's an internationally recognized authority on tarot, Kabbalah and ceremonial magic and he's written extensively about the life and the work of Aleister Crowley. He's currently the U.S. Deputy Grand Master of Ordo Templi Orientis, and he's here to talk about his latest book, Allow Me to Introduce, which is an insider's guide to the occult. If you have any questions or comments, Verlon, please let me know in a message in private chat from the Perex chat room. And those of you who are listening out of light chat, um, please come join us at Para Radio, uh, para X Radio Network.com. Lon, it's been quite a while since you paid us a visit. I think it was back in 19, well, no, 2014. Right. Um, we talked about the wiser book of horror and the occult. We both have more gray hair now. Yeah. And bottom line is, it's really nice having you back. Thank you very much for inviting me again. It's, uh, it's a crazy time we're in. Yes, it is, and we need a little uh, little things to kind of get us away from it and, and learn some things, and um, a cult is a, is a good thing to talk about, um, 
And we need reading material. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Netflix is fine, you know, but yeah, we love to read. And uh, But I want to ask you one question before we kind of jump in. I mean, I really love backstories, and I'm curious as to how the inspiration for your song, I Am He, came about, because it really is short, sweet, and, and very, um, very interesting. Uh, I wrote it when I was 19. Oh, cool. And, and, uh, the inspiration was I, I bought a, a classical guitar, and uh, I'd never had one before. And um, I always sort of enjoyed the sort of the Bach uh, Baroque uh, uh, kind of uh, style on a on a classical guitar, and I was noodling around, got the, uh, got the melody, and at the time I was uh, uh, very interested in Eastern mysticism, and. Uh, uh, was experimenting with LSD. I have to tell you that, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, I had an had an experience uh, that uh, sort of uh, gave me a glimpse of the singularity of consciousness and uh, the fact that uh, uh, each monad of uh, of consciousness is a perfect reflection of the singularity. And it was just sort of as simple as that. The words just uh, 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 came out as such. And uh, that was my 19-year-old plunge into, <laughs> into mystical <laughs> song, songwriting. And to tell you the truth, I had forgotten uh, pretty much all about it. And uh, uh, when I started... Uh, uh, during the, the first wave of my musical career, which is in 1969 through 72, uh, that's when I was recording and, and such. And I was and my my style and my band and, and uh, the records I recorded uh, weren't quite that uh, in your face mystical, but they were sort of like acid cowboy uh, <laughs> songs. <laughs> Uh, and uh, then, you know, I gave it a rest for about 25 years. And uh, when I started writing again, and, and uh, my good friend Alan uh, started to produce me again, uh, I, I dug it up and, and I said, oh, that would sound good on a steel string. And uh, that, that's that. I liked it. I really did. It's it's unique. It's simplistic. There, I mean, there's a whole bunch of layers to something so simple. Well, well, yeah. It's uh, you know, it's a pretty simple uh, revelation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, it's it's just sort of like uh, uh, everybody that hits that uh, hits that point. Uh, uh, gets that same uh, same sort of moment of of awakening, and it's uh, it's not that any it's not something you figure out. <laughs> you, know, you don't study your way into that moment. You know, you uh, it just happens when it happens. That's and, that V eight uh, moment. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one when that knocks you in the head. Good. Well, you know, I, I found it interesting. I've got a couple of questions from the chat room already but I want to bring this up that um, you talk about being very lucky and and I mean this is this is so what funny I mean not funny but interesting the way all the things that you were lucky about um, and you mentioned that in the introduction right. and you know I, and it just it made me smile going down each and every one of them I mean I was just like you know you're in such and such a year you were lucky for this and you know Lucky to become socially awkward, which is something that some people would not consider luck. Um, introduced to LSD, um, become so prophetically inspired that you telephoned um, Constance in Nebraska and proposed marriage. Okay. Um, like, lucky to that was sign. Also, that was also on LSD. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, did you get married? Yes, uh, you know we we've been married fifty two years and and uh, uh, 
we joke and say, I don't know why I asked her, and she doesn't know why she said yes. So. And 52 years later, you're living happily ever after. That says a lot for itself, you know. Well, well we're living, yeah. Well, yeah. And that, that's, yes, but you know, I, the- but uh, yeah, I, I was lucky, uh, and I am, uh, I am lucky. I'm lucky to, to be talking with you. Uh, oh. It's, uh, uh, it, I think it's more than just a, just a point of view. It's more than me just being a Pollyanna, but I think being a Pollyanna is helpful <laughs> in, in, yes. in attracting luck, or at least recognizing it when you, when you see it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so well, maybe, that's maybe, it. Recognition is important. Yeah. I don't think luck likes to be ignored. And also, uh, you know, it's kind of funny, Marla. I, uh, I don't, I've never had a, a plan. I've never set any goals. And I always, and I know everybody says that's the thing to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but when people told me that when I was a kid, I thought that was just so square. <laughs> 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 You know, make a plan, have a goal, and then achieve that mm-hmm. goal. Then make another goal, and mm-hmm. and and it always struck me as being terribly wrong. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And it was just like a form of of attachment, and and it was trying to outguess luck, outguess fate. Uh, and luck and fate just sometimes just have their own plans Mm -hmm. and uh, just making short-term selfish little uh, goals uh, just sort of gets in the way of the of the flow of stuff Mm -hmm. and and this isn't something that I that I came to a big conscious conclusion of no I'm always I, I'm just lazy. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just too lazy to make a goal. I'm too lazy to have plans, mm-hmm. and and uh, and it might be a form of of attention deficit disorder or something like that. Um, I was the class clown in school, mm-hmm. and uh, they say that class clowns, uh, you know, uh, have attention deficit disorder and mm-hmm. and in grade school the report cards all, always had a little box that said self control is he good in self control <laughs> well when, when when you're a when you're a class clown you always get the box marked failed in self or needs needs help or needs improvement Class clown isn't so bad. I got labeled as a um, washing machine because I kind of got the class agitated at times by acting out. Yeah. So there you go. (laughs) What can I say? But, you know, when you do make plans, sometimes I think um, you put up walls not realizing it. You put up boundaries when you make the plans. And that's probably another reason why, you know, you can't be rigid about that. You kind of have to... Go with the flow and do what you feel. I think. Well, it's not that I don't get focused, and it's not that I that I don't, uh, you know, I'm creative, and it's not that I don't enjoy uh, being uh, successful at certain projects and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, uh, w- what I feel gr- gratification for is nothing that I <laughs> I set out to get. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but I'm grateful for it when it when it uh, when it when it comes when it appears. So that was and, the luck. And and so there's the there's the lucky thing. So I started the book off by by listing all of the crazy things I've just been lucky to uh, fall into in my mm-hmm. uh, 71 years of being lucky. See. You can never be too lucky, not at all. But let, let, before we get to the book, as I said, we've got a couple of chat room questions, so I want to jump in there so we don't leave anybody out. 
Um, first one says, in your introduction, ceremonial magic was mentioned. Now, how did you develop an interest in and at what age did you get involved with witchcraft and ceremonial magic? And Lon, before you answer that, some people might not know what ceremonial magic is, so you might want to bring that up first. Well, ceremonial magic is sort of the Western form of Eastern mysticism. <laughs> It's, it's like Western, Western Eastern mysticism. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, uh, in the West, and with ceremonial magic, uh, it's, uh, it deals with all the same sort of spiritual uh, uh, activities and mind-expanding uh, uh, techniques and, and things, but, but it, instead of dealing uh, inwardly, with things uh, like Eastern mysticism is is very uh, uh, you know focused on uh, in, internalizing everything, being quiet, uh, uh, stilling the mind, and and in a sense systematically removing all the things that you aren't until you hit this divine. Uh, people criticize it and call it call it nothingness, but it's not nothingness. It's it's uh, you hit the singularity. It's the smooth uh, point of of where you, you realize what you are by first realizing what you are not. Mm. And uh, the Western way, we're more outward in our stuff. We like to do the same things. We're going for that same uh, uh, spiritual awakening. But we like to, to uh, do it by manipulating things out, seemingly outside of ourselves. So that's why we like, uh, uh, we like ritual, and we like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the lower end of it, we love scripture and, uh, and you know, preachers and things, uh, things like that. And so the, the West has this equivalent to the Eastern uh, uh, central book in, in the east the Tao Te Ching is the the foundation of all sorts of schools of eastern mysticism and it's a very very <laughs> the zen like book okay zen came afterwards but uh yeah, it's very subtle and beautiful and wonderful and it's just so profound that it makes you high when you read it it's uh, mm -hmm. it's called it looks like Tao Te King, but it, uh, it's usually it's pronounced Tao Te Ching. Mm. And in the West, we've got the equivalent of that, and it's in a tiny little book. That's the foundation of the, the school of thought called Kabbalah, mm -hmm. and it's uh, the the little tiny book, Kabbalah book. It's the oldest Kabbalah book in. Uh, uh, that we know of, and it's called the Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Formation, or the or the Book of Creation, uh, and it shows you how to, uh, in a sense, connect everything in the universe with everything else until there's no anything left to connect, and then you hit that same spot that the Eastern mystics were shooting for by by uh, removing all the things they're not. Does mm -hmm. that make any sense? Yeah. You, you, yeah. you hit the same goal by coming at it in two different directions. One's mm -hmm. inward and the other's outward. So ceremonial magic is the, is the dramatic psychodrama of connecting everything in the universe with everything else outwardly. And so that's where you, you get this idea of working with a, a hierarchy of spiritual forces uh, that start at the at God, the singularity, uh, and uh, which is neither God, male or female. It's <laughs> it's both and neither, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, that's like the the main pattern of a fractal of infinite fractals of of consciousness coming coming down. And those fractals of consciousness uh, uh, are m metaphorically seen as angels, archangels, angels, 
uh, intelligences, seraphim, cherubim, uh, uh, powers, principalities, intelligences, spirits, demons, uh, until you've, you've got the entire spectrum of consciousness from the Godhead all the way down to your head. Mm. Uh, and then the ceremonial magician uses uh, uh, outward tools like, like wands and cups and swords and discs and, and uh, talismans and such to uh, slowly, systematically uh, raise his or her consciousness uh, following the, the, this line of fractals back to, back to Godhead. So it's a dramatic art form, and, and it's an art form that has uh, uh, traditionally been uh, completely discouraged by the Roman Catholic Church <laughs> <laughs> because it, it seems to not fit in with their worldview of, uh, of, uh, of heaven and hell and all of this. It seems like... Uh, uh, it's uh, dangerously close to a person taking control over their own sp- souls, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's it's had a bad reputation over over the centuries, uh, yeah. mostly just because of the Catholic Church. But they were mad at everything, so yes. uh, 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 so it's ha- it does have a bad reputation. And when you tell people on the airplane that. Uh, that well, I evoke demons now and then. It's you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly wholesome. Um, you know, it's, as long mm-hmm. as you're doing it to, toward the end of your own awakening. So, right. <laughs> so when, um, how old were you? What was your um, age when you were kind of getting into um, um, ceremonial magic? About the time I wrote that song. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> about, I was about 19, yeah. Okay, good. Got a good start. Well, I want to mention in that vein that you did write a book called My Life with Spirits, which is all about a glimpse into the world of a modern ceremonial magician, namely you. And um, I hope at some point down the line you might want to come back for a visit and talk about that as well. Oh, Absolutely. I'm I'm in the process of reading it on my Facebook page every day for uh, about fifteen minutes every morning at ten o'clock. Oh, nice. Okay, and, give your. And I give your... I just started that. Uh, I just started that this morning, oh. and uh, so if you go to my Facebook page, uh, you can catch the first ten minutes uh, this morning, and I'll do it again tomorrow. Perfect, and if you know. They can go back to the ones that they missed, and, and wonderful. So it's just, um, your Facebook is just Ron Milo Duquette, right? That's right. Okay. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't buy the book. True, true. I mean, you know, little bits and pieces, it's different. And you know what, the thing is that, that your writing style is very unique, in that the information you provide is serious and sometimes really weighty, yet you offer it up in a way that's understandable to everybody. And apparently, I think you were wise enough not to read the same author guidelines that assured many writers that they would be successful if they began their works with, it was a dark and stormy night. So I just want to thank you for being you. Uh, Oh, thank you. mm -hmm. I I just try to write the book that I wish I would have read Uh uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, it, uh, I just want to write the book that would have uh, knocked about five years off my learning curve. Well, you're doing that for the rest of us now, so that that's a good thing. And so let's tell people that um, the book is a collection of introductions and prefaces to books. Now, they're wonderful books. They're other people's wonderful books, some of whom who have been guests here on my show. I mean, I'd like to say I interviewed Dr. Dr. John D. and Alistair Crowley, but I'm very happy to have had two people who wrote, who you wrote info, infos and prefaces for, um, Donald Michael Craig and Mark Stavish. So they were both past guests. So. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, Don Craig and I were, were uh, good friends, and uh, we would, uh, every year there's a large pagan event called Pantheacon that mm-hmm. uh, takes place in, uh, or took place, this was the last one, 
uh, in San Jose every year. And so uh, uh, I, I went to all of them except, the, I think, the first two. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Donald and I would, uh, would always uh, show up at the same sort of pagan festivals and stuff because we were always... Uh, uh, or we were asked to speak, and so we were. We, we became over the years good friends, mm-hmm. and every year we'd we'd ride up to PantheaCon together. We'd uh, I'd drive up to his house in in uh, uh, like San Fernando area, mm-hmm. and then together uh, we would uh, drive up to uh, San Francisco, which is about a, a, an eight hour drive. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it it was the I look forward every year to that drive up and back because mm. he's just so funny, yeah. and uh, uh, he's totally brilliant. And I was just I can't tell you how heartbroken I was when he yeah. passed away. Yes, yes, he was good. And I, Mark I, Stavish, I, yeah, Mark Stavish and I uh, uh, show up at a lot of Masonic uh, mm-hmm. esoteric Masonic events. Things. Yeah, see, so there's always people in common. It's never, it's never coincidental. I think. <laughs> no, no. Um, there's now, limited cast of characters in our lives. <laughs> yes, there is. It's true. Um, you know, the book is broken down. I'm just giving people a little insight into six, seven sections according to topic, like Kabbalah and Tarot, the Lemic Magic, magical masonry, and um, each section is broken down into subheads. And the first part or part one, is Teachers, Heroes, and Mentors. And you've included Aleister Crowley and Israel Regarde um, in your top list of Teachers, Heroes, and Mentors. Now, how did the two of them, one who has passed away long before you were born, and the other one um, who you knew and corresponded with, had such an effect on you in such a profound way? Well, Crowley... uh uh, well, <clears throat> they both came together. They they arose together in my consciousness <clears throat> because uh, uh, I got attracted to uh, sort of the the, the Western uh, Hermetic uh, philosophies, uh, and I I joined the Rosicrucian Order AMORC. Do you remember them? Mm-hmm. A M O R C. They would mm-hmm. advertise in Popular Mechanics and things. That's uh, not where I saw it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's very nice. I don't regret a moment I spent studying their monographs and and doing temple work in Long Beach. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I got interested in uh, uh, like Kabbalah and things like that uh, mm-hmm. in, in Amork. And uh, through Amork, friends in Amork, I got interested in tarot and uh, Hermetic Kabbalah through the teachings of the builders of the Adytum, uh or BOTA. And uh, so I got really into tarot, and, and, I, and I was in the Rosicrucian Order Amork. Uh, then one day in 1970, or I think, or 70. Seventy-one. I was at the the B. Dalton's Pickwick Bookstore. I loved that place. I lived there when I was a kid. And uh, I saw this box of uh, I didn't know what it was, but it had the Hermetic Rose Cross, a stylized version of the Rose Cross on the box. And I went, "Ooh, uh, <laughs> Rose Cross! I'm a Rosicrucian. I lie. I'm into that." And then I looked at the box closely and it was a deck of tarot cards and I went ooh it's, it's tarot cards <laughs> and so I spent twelve dollars on a deck of cards that would now probably sells for about twelve hundred yeah. on eBay um, and uh, I took it home and I opened it up and looked looked in it and the cards did not look like BOTA cards. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they they did not look like uh, a writer weight uh, tarot deck. Mm-hmm. Okay, they looked like tarot, all right, but it was very awesomely beautiful. 
mm. and disturbingly different. <laughs> and and uh, I went through the through the cards, and uh, you know, I looked at the fool first. And the fool looks crazy, <laughs> and then I, it dawned on me: well, the fool's supposed to be crazy, you know. Mm. Uh, but anyway, it was disturbing, and, it, uh, and I was still sort of a superstitious young young man, still uh, uh, trying to recover from the the traumatic programming of uh, evangelical uh, uh, Christianity as a young man. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know, these cards are so beautiful. Uh, I, I almost sense a supernaturalness uh, about this, you know. And uh, as a musician, I was familiar with the story of Paganini, the famous violinist, who uh, uh, could play so well that all of the other violinists uh, said, no human can play like that. The devil must have helped him out. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of like the, the Robert Johnson at the crossroads uh, right. legend. Yes. Yeah. And um, so I, I thought, you know, these cards are so disturbing that uh, and beautiful and they were affecting me. They're making my heart beat fast and stuff. Uh, I wonder if the devil had something to do with it. <laughs> and then I had this little, little cheap occult dictionary that that I bought at Ralph's at the checkout stand, <laughs> right along with with do-it-yourself macrame and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked up Alistair. It said on the side, created by Aleister Crowley, mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. I pronounced it in those days. Right. Uh, and I looked it up in the little dictionary, and it says, Aleister Crowley, famous Scottish Satanist. And I went, oh, God, I was right. Oh, gee, I don't want to have anything <laughs> to do with these cars. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I, eventually I got disabused and and realized that Crowley was, was really something... Uh, uh, that uh, if I was going to be interested in this stuff, I was going to have to get into. Mm -hmm. And I read his, I read his book of Thoth that went with uh, with the cards, and I realized this this guy, he's a little strange, but <laughs> but I think I really like him, and uh, uh, I really got uh, encouraged when mm -hmm. I read a couple books by Israel Regardi. Uh, this man called Israel Regardi, and I, I read his Tree of Life and a few other uh, 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 books, but I read his uh, biography of Crowley mm -hmm. uh, called The Eye in the Triangle. Mm -hmm. And um, within uh, uh, oh, sh <laughs> a couple years, I, was, I lucked into meeting uh, old uh, contemporary uh, students of Crowley, uh, Phyllis uh, Seckler and, and uh, Grady McMurtry and Helen Parsons Smith, and uh, I got. Uh, they initiated me into the deg uh, degrees of the of the OTO, or Crowley's Magical mm -hmm. or Order, mm -hmm. and uh, in short order, they introduced me to uh, Israel Regardi, who just lived uh, about forty miles up the road here. Mm. And uh, then he and I became friends, and uh, we started working on a project together, uh, uh, cataloging all the people that said that they were Aleister Crowley reincarnated. <laughs> we, we, oh, both got, we both got a lot of letters from people that, that wanted us to, to uh, affirm that they're Crowley incarnated. And we were going to call it Liebert Nuts. And, uh, huh. uh, but anyway, I, I, yeah. I um, lucked into I, being uh, uh, friends with, with uh, Israel, Regardi. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. Um, when we come back, Lon, and I'd like to keep talking a little bit about Crowley, um, long enough for you to tell a tale that I heard you tell a while back about him. Anyway, we'll be back in a flash. Everybody sit tight and um, two minutes, we'll be back. 
don't go away. There's more Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages. Rhett, Rhett, where are you going? I'm going back to the paranormal view, back where I belong. Please, please, take me with you. No, I'm through with everything here. I want to see if there's something left in life I haven't explored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Rhett, Rhett, don't run to them. They talk about ghosts and hauntings, UFOs, and all kind of supernatural scary stuff. You'll never understand, will you, Scarlet? No! Well, that's your misfortune. Rhett! 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 Rhett, if you go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear... Line! Oh, you you've got to be line. kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan. Every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. Hey everyone, it's Marla. If you like tonight's episode of Stirring the Cauldron and the Archive Podcast as well, take a look at the show's YouTube channel and check out the dozens of shows that are there just waiting to be heard. New shows are added each week, and while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. And if you click on that tiny little bell icon at the top of the page, you'll be notified when new shows are available. Just go to YouTube.com and then type in Stirring the Cauldron Para X and the link will appear. Just like magic. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hi, um, we're back, and my guest tonight is Lon Milo Duquette, and we're talking about his new book, Allow Me to Introduce. So, Lon, as I said before the break, I heard you tell a story about Prolete um, and his Sherpa guides. That was so deliciously wonderful. Um, would you please tell the tale, and then I'm going to follow up with a question in that regards to make it like I have really good reason to have you tell that story. Okay. But it, it made a light bulb go over my head when, when I heard it, so... Go ahead. Well, the, uh, you know, magic is causing change to occur in conformity with your will. So uh, you know, anything is a magical act if it's, if it's a willed act, because you know, it doesn't have to have demons and, and uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, Crowley was a, was a mountain climber and a, and a serious... Uh, Serious mountain climber at that. As a matter of fact, there's several world records that he still. Uh, uh, wait a second. Yes, dear. Oh, okay. The boss was there. The <laughs> boss was. There. Uh, anyway. Uh, some of his mountain climbing records, especially uh, his Himalayan uh, things, still hold. Uh, but he was, um, uh, and of course, uh, this is a story. I wasn't there, so you'll you'll <laughs> have to have to take take my tale. Yes. Uh, he uh, he assaulted. That's what they call it. He tried mm-hmm. to assault uh, the the second highest mountain in the world, K2, uh, uh, in the, I, I believe this was still in the late 1800s, uh, and uh, I might be mistaken, but uh, the guides that they had to to hire. Uh, had revolted the the year before with another European mountain climbing expedition. They had uh, revolted when the Europeans wanted them to do something that was uh, too dangerous, and they insisted that they go on. And uh, the 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 helpers, the porters, the Sherpas, uh, had uh, revolted and killed the party. The European Party. Now, uh, Crowley's ex- ex- or expedition hired the same guys, 
Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, and I don't know if if Crowley knew about this or or did not know about it, but uh, somebody screwed up and hired the same guys. Well, they went so high up, uh, and they got to the point of where they revolted the last time, mm-hmm. and they were grumbling about going back, and. Uh, because they said it was too dangerous. And Crowley, of course, didn't want to go back. And um, he said, I tell you what, I'll take uh, uh, two of the, the Sherpas. You guys camp down here, um, and uh, I'll take two of the Sherpas up uh, on the next leg just to show you that it's, it's safe. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, well, it, in that classic dramatic kind of scene, a sort of an ice ledge or an ice bridge uh, uh, collapsed, and the two Sherpas fell to their death. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Crowley fell too, but not far enough to die, and he made it back to, uh, to camp, okay, and he was, he was stuck with the situation of being of telling these almost bandit Sherpas that it was so dangerous up ahead that their two buddies just got killed. Mm-hmm. And so that, that would have been suicide to right. say that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so Crowley uh, was familiar sort of with the superstitious uh, uh, traditions of these people. And when he got back to camp and uh, uh, he told the other European members of the, of the expedition what happened, and they were just uh, t- terrified, uh, Crowley uh, marched up to, to the head of the, the Sherpas, and they were asking where the other guys went. And Crowley... Uh, uh, said, well, last night, I just got hungry, and I shot them and ate them. <laughs> and it was such an outrageous uh, thing to say. And he said it with such callousness and with such, uh, like he was uh, psychotic, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that it scared them so bad that they didn't uh, revolt. I think he probably pulled a revolver on them, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, it was enough to get them back off the mountain with, without these guys killing them. <laughs> so when the Alpine Club, uh, who already didn't like what Foley was, was uh, doing because he wasn't doing it under the auspices of the Alpine Club, uh, when they got back to India, uh, there were already reporters uh, dogging Crowley, asking him, is it true that when you're on K2 uh, that you killed and ate two of your Sherpas? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I know Crowley's uh, an audacious guy and everything else, but uh, honestly, what would you say? If someone said, ask you something that ludicrous, mm-hmm. you know, I think you'd say just what Crowley says. He said, oh, sure, yeah, I, uh, you I'm know, I, I don't move. Uh, of, of course, <laughs> I got hungry. It's very it's matter cold. of fact. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. And so they reported that he had murdered two of his Sherpas and, and he, and he just thought it was amusing. Mm-hmm. But that that rumor dogged him. Uh, people still say, you know, he murdered his Sherpas. That's funny. All right, so here's my question. You referred to that story as pure Crowley. And a few minutes ago, I said, in essence, that your writings are pure you. Did Crowley's work have any influence on you as a writer of books and songs, not to be one of the sheep who followed the crowd and lose their individuality? Oh, Oh, probably so, but not not consciously so. I, okay. you know, I never set out to be a writer uh, in the first place, and uh, uh, 
I just sort of have to. I'm just lucky that my my writing has been well received, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm too lazy to try to imitate anyone else's style. Uh, I'm too. Uh, 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 I'm just kind of unattached. Uh, unattached to it. I'm pleased when it works, but uh, uh, I'm always surprised. <laughs> Works really well. And you know what? I want to say this, that your book is so full of food for thought. And I love that aspect that can make me look up answers to questions that pop into my head when I'm reading. And for example, you have a chapter about the Lima magic and the many people associated with the Lima um, was Alistair Crowley. And I once had read that the aspects of the Lima and Crowley's thoughts in general inspired the development of Wicca which I found to be very interesting because many refer to Wicca as the fluffy bunnies of the magical world and, and Crowley was anything from being fluffy or a bunny. Yeah. Um, so I went digging around Gerald Gardner. I mean, it led me to that, you know, and for those who don't know, he's called the father of Wicca. And to make a long story short, I learned that when Gardner was initiated into the New Forest Coven in 1939, he decided to revive the faith, supplementing the coven's rituals with ideas borrowed from Freemasonry, ceremonial magic, and the writings of Aleister Crowley. And, and that's what formed the Gardnerian tradition of Wicca. So I, I, what I guess I'm saying is thank you for shaking up my gray matter while I was reading what I was reading because it, it made it so much more interesting. Well, uh, can't you see how how Gardner would just love Crowley and that Crowley would just love Gardner? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was just like, okay, that's and an they oxymoron. Were bells. They were yeah. bells, and Gardner was yeah. in the OTO, and and uh, a lot of Gardner material uh, uh, he uh, uh, he borrowed from Crowley, but not that Crowley would object, uh, even you know. They both had a vision of a of a neo pagan revival, uh, and they they saw it as a, as an expansion of the consciousness of humanity. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, instead of going back to the old ways, it's it's just using it's using the the, the art forms of the old ways to to uh, uh, accommodate the next step in consciousness. So the mm-hmm. boys were the boys were a good pair. They were. And, you know, I mean, here's another thing that jumped out at me that I'm going to drop these carrots so people really grab the book and start reading and looking at things. But when I was in elementary school in the Dark Ages, we went on a field trip to see the opera The Magic Flute. It was supposedly something that would appeal to children, and I really can't remember that far back, but I don't think I was too impressed. I was like eight years old. Um, But when I was reading your book, you spoke of the opera, um, of Mozart and of masonry. So what did Mozart and his opera, The Magic Flute, have to do with masonry? I mean, clearly, my um, eight-year-old brain liked the music, I guess, but I didn't realize that there were more layers to the opera than perhaps the adults would have noticed. Oh, man, yeah. And, uh, uh, well, Mozart was a mason, okay? He joined joined the masons... uh, uh, I think about six or seven years before before he died, and uh, uh, Schikaneder, who uh, wrote the libretto for uh, Magic Flute, uh, was also a Mason, and uh, it was really kind of a underground, sexy thing to be a Mason in. Uh, uh, like Vienna and uh, and Europe at that time, because it was the Masons uh, who were stirring the pot of what would be called the Enlightenment mm-hmm. uh, period, and the Enlightenment period, uh, uh, you know, held uh, uh, science and uh, and logic and the Brotherhood of Man uh, all as uh, central uh, to their uh, philosophy. And it was a wonderful, it was sort of a golden age of, of experimentation in science and art and everything. But it was at loggerheads with uh, the royalty and the, the monarchies of, of Europe. 
and and so it, in other words enlightenment was going to lead to the french revolution and the american revolution and uh, uh so it was kind of dangerous to be to be a mason and it truly was uh more of a secret secret society than it than it is today uh when you mm-hmm. can just go to the internet and just read everything and you go well what's the big thing <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. and uh but in those days, it was. And uh, so they wrote uh, sort of uh, artistically subversive uh, little opera. It's almost a vaudeville. It was um, uh, very light, very light, mm-hmm. fun. Guys dressed up like birds and things like that. And... Uh, it was really, really cute, but in it, it all revolves around this secret society of sun worshippers or worshippers of uh, of Osiris, uh, and uh, a lot of their their claptrap, the way they vote, uh, the, the, their the, all the philosophy that they they spout is all pure masonry, mm. and and. Uh, so the uh, Masons at the time uh, were mad at Mozart, saying that, gee, he's revealing all these secrets and stuff. But uh, uh, it, and for many many years, uh, Magic Flute was was only suggested that it had Masonic uh, uh, overtones. Uh, but now everybody knows. Oh man, it's this is a Masonic opera, and uh, when Placido Domingo took over the L.A. Opera uh, a few years back, uh, they mounted the Magic Flute, and and I was lucky, truly, I was lucky <laughs> uh, to be invited to give the pre uh, opening night. Uh, uh, Little lecture before uh, before the opera, oh, nice. uh, talking about Mozart, magic, and masonry, and that's one of the that's one of the chapters in my allow me to introduce. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yes, it is, and so you know we're we're dangling carrots here all over the place, but um, there there's so much in that book, seriously. That um, I mean, you know, we haven't time is running out really quickly, but I mean, you know, you wrote about um, different chapters about the Kabbalah and the Tarot, and I mean there so much, so much in that book, and so easy to read, and and really kind of fun because it's lighthearted, as I said, it's serious in a way, but um, it, it's rather really interesting and should be on everybody's library shelf, I think, because I that, totally agree with you on that. See, we're we're in uh, <laughs> we're in good agreement with that. Um, in the last couple of minutes, now we, we've mentioned really briefly about the OTO, um, um, but we didn't really give a very good explanation about what it is and, and what it's about beca- and, and your role there. Well, the OTO actually started as a Masonic uh, academy oh. in, uh, in Europe in uh, the late 1800s. And... Um, uh, Crowley ended up uh, uh, becoming a, becoming a member because almost in an honorary capacity because of his uh, uh, esoteric uh, fame, uh, and uh, Crowley ended up uh, uh, becoming the leader of the OTO after uh, people conveniently or inconveniently died di- died off. Uh, but they wanted to, uh, uh, because of the universality of, of uh, masonry and, and hermeticism and esoteric thought, uh, it is absolutely absurd that an organization that uh, would uh, uh, presume to, to teach and perpetuate uh, esoteric matters uh, it's absurd that an organization like that would would not allow women in it and masonry, uh, uh, regular stock white bread masonry, is uh, was at the time and largely still is an old boys club. 
Mm-hmm. And Crowley said, "Now, if, we're, if I'm if I'm going to uh, be head of uh, 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 an organization that that seemingly teaches the, the you know the equivalent of tantric yoga, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's no way we're not going to have women uh, uh, in it." And they they petitioned. Uh, uh, sort of a ma- the mainstream uh, c- centralized authority in Europe uh, to uh, recognize them uh, if they recognized women, and uh, they got turned down. So they said, Crowley said, screw it. Uh, we'll stop making Masons. I'll change the rituals. Uh, we won't say we're Masons anymore. We'll just go on our on our own happy way here. And that's that's the OTO, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Crowley finally took uh, 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 formal head of the uh, of the OTO in uh, uh, oh gee, I guess it was around 1918, uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, Crowley material was published under the uh, imprint of the OTO. And uh, the, the OTO is a wonderful uh, organization that almost went extinct after Crowley's death in 1947. And it was only uh, in the, the early 70s that uh, Grady McMurtry uh, and Phyllis uh, Seckler, uh, uh, w- with the help and, and support, moral support of Israel Brigardi, uh, started initiating again. And I was among the uh, the first people that they initiated after it got resurrected after Crowley's death. Another stroke of luck. Now, the only luck we don't have is we have to get out of here now. Um, so, oh, oh. I know, it goes too fast. I didn't but, know we started. So. <laughs> we, we didn't. We didn't scratch the surface. But anyway, um, everybody can find you on Facebook, yes? Yes. And they yes. can find out about you, your books, and all that stuff. And I want to thank you so much for coming in tonight and um, we're getting notes in the chat room that you need to come back and I mentioned that before so one of these days I'll be in touch and we'll we'll do that and um, I, I want to also thank everybody for listening in and being kind and, and generous and and I think they were so enthralled nobody wrote in the chat room much tonight so this is really a good sign oh they figured that I wouldn't let them get a word in edgewise no, oh, no, 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 no. They, usually, you know, some people, they go at it. But no, really interesting tonight. So um, for those who are listening on the podcast later on, thank you for listening as well. And um, to got to get out of here. So to all of you, until next time, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited.